graduating from the Columbia Journalism School this year, just like Carl Ackerman did nearly 100 years ago. He walked out of these doors and was soon in Berlin, reporting from the trenches on what's been called the bloodiest war of the 20th century. Only a destroyed German army leadership will make the people overthrow the group of men who do Germany's political thinking today. I'm graduating from the Columbia Journalism School in May and just celebrating my 23rd birthday. Back when he was 23, Columbia grad Merrill Rukeyser was in charge of all the city's financial and business news at the New York Tribune. People turned to him for answers when stock markets crashed in 1929. On Black Thursday, before the afternoon rally, speculators and investors temporarily were all sellers. The explanation of the collapse is as simple as that. In 1935, Columbia journalism graduate John Hohenberg covered the trial for the kidnap and murder of the Lindbergh baby. The pack fairly shivered with apprehension. Suppose, each asked his neighbor, just suppose they let him go. Suppose, just suppose they only give him life. But the pack might as well have saved its fears. In two minutes, the verdict arrived. Death in chair. Seventy years ago, scores of would-be students set off for the front lines of the Second World War. One Columbia grad, A.J. Liebling, hid out in the hull of a U.S. landing craft as bullets flew past to report on D-Day for the New Yorker magazine. I looked down at the main deck, and the Beach Battalion men were already moving ahead, so I knew that the ramps must be down. Callum and I flattened our backs against the pilot house and pulled in our stomachs, as if to give a possible bullet an extra couple of inches clearance. World War II was an opportunity for more women to join the journalism school, like 22-year-old Marguerite Higgins. After she graduated, she was one of the first to land in Korea to report on the war. But U.S. military commanders banned female journalists until Higgins persuaded General Douglas MacArthur to personally reverse the policy. Failure to reach the front would undermine all my arguments that I was entitled to the same assignment breaks as any man. In the mid-60s, Vietnam cast a long shadow over Columbia as well as the rest of the country. Students could look out their windows and see rallies against the war on the streets. Beverly Deep Kiever flew to Saigon in 1962 with no job. She ended up covering one of the largest sieges of the war and stayed longer than any other Western correspondent. The communist three-day blitz war, actually a war within a war, has opened up the possibility of the United States losing its first major war in history. Columbia grad John Noble Wilford was on hand to cover one of the most defining moments of the decade. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour, liftoff on Apollo 11. Mr. Armstrong opened the landing craft's hatch, stepped slowly down the ladder, and declared as he planted the first human footprint on the lunar crust. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. A Columbia grad was behind one of the biggest stories of modern journalism, Watergate. Washington Post managing editor Howard Simons assigned Woodward and Bernstein to the story, backed them when others at the paper ridiculed the investigation, and came up with the name Deep Throat. In the 1970s, Columbia was shaken up by CBS executive Fred Friendly, who added TV and documentary to the curriculum. One of his students was Tom Batag, who would go on to produce the CBS Evening News. As Columbia grew in reach and size, students who never dreamed of attending the school streamed through the doors, like John Quinones. He grew up in a barrio in San Antonio, Texas, shining shoes and picking tomatoes for a living. After he graduated, he joined ABC News. His report on the Congolese rainforest shed light on the critical need for environmental protection. Deep in the northern Congo, an enchanted world where butterflies grow as large as birds and trees rise as tall as buildings. In the 90s, Mitch Album took advantage of the newly formed business and journalism degree offered by the school. 
He later authored the best-selling book Tuesdays with Maury, based on interviews he conducted with a dying ALS patient, Maury Schwartz. I'm Steve Croft. In 1975, I graduated from the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia, and 25 years later, I went off to report a story in Pakistan about the rise of Islamic fundamentalism there just a year before 9-11. For years, the Taliban were permitted to operate openly in the border regions of Pakistan. The government was unwilling to take them on politically or militarily. Now, Pakistan is facing a monster it helped create and has been forced to act. Eight years later, C.J. Chivers is on the outskirts of the Pakistani border. A former valedictorian of the journalism school, he covered the war in Afghanistan for the New York Times. Another round struck. Soldiers huddled as it screamed down and exploded. Private First Class William Solorzano described the unforgettable sound. It's a bad noise, he said. Then he reconsidered. Actually, it's a beautiful noise if you get to hear it. Because if you don't hear it, that's because you're dead. In 2006, Rabia Raghid trained in digital media at the journalism school. Five years later in Tahrir Square, she wrote, filmed, live blogged, and tweeted stories from the center of the Egyptian revolution. Just listen to the chants roaring in downtown Cairo, the hundreds of people walking to the streets. It's unprecedented for people to march to the streets this way as an act of protest without security trying to prevent them. I'm graduating. I'm graduating. I'm graduating. I'm graduating. I'm graduating. I'm graduating. I'm graduating from the Columbia Journalism School in May, just like 100 years of graduates before me. And after 100 years of defining moments, of persistence, of finding sources, 100 years of changing technology, of deadlines, of ups and downs, 100 years of seducing and betraying, of sleepless nights. We're leaving this school to continue a tradition of the only 100 that matters. 100 years of storytelling.